any man. That's good. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy. And uh, chapter number 1. First Timothy chapter number one and verse number verse number eight. The, the apostle said, But we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mother, mothers, for manslayers. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer? and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy Amen. because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Amen. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it? Now watch carefully. For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to the life everlasting. And now the praise issues forth from him. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, bless the holy word now. In thy name I pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul never forgot where he came from. He never forgot what he was. There's some powerful statements in here. He said, I am the chief of all the sinners on the earth. I am chief, not I was chief, but I am chief. He now, for the first time in his life, has a real perception of what sin is. Not when he was a Pharisee, not when he was religious, not when he was zealous. He had no idea of how God saw sin. And he had no concept at all of the real nature of sin. And so the Apostle Paul was a very zealous person. You're going to find that zealous people sometimes are your worst enemies. And you're going to find that religious zealots are the worst of all because they'll kill you. They'll blow you up in the name of Allah or some other God. So zealotry is no indication of truth. Someone says, well, he's dedicated and he's sincere. Certainly is. About five, six hundred years ago, they used to walk through the streets and they had a stick and they had prompt, they had nails attached to chains and they would do this to their back. They would flagellate themselves. They did that until the blood ran down. They were very zealous, very dedicated, very sincere, and very wrong. Yeah. Just because you shed your own blood is no indication of the truth. And so the Apostle Paul was zealous because he drugged people off to have them stoned to death. No doubt stood there while they were stoned to death. Mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, he was part of it. But notice what God came to him with in spite of that. He said in verse 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of our Lord, the grace of our Lord, the grace came to him, was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I showed hate and malice, and God showed me love and forgiveness. I murdered people and he was gracious to me. I came out of my religion when I had to face a face, face to face encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the key to the whole thing. In verse number 16 he says, that in me first 
Notice how the first is involved here. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. He long suffered with Paul. This is a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Apostle Paul says that the way he saved me in his graciousness and his mercy and his long suffering, he showed me love and forgiveness. He came to me. I was the first to be made a pattern for all them that would hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That's very important because every one of you in this house tonight, he loves. And every one of you in this house tonight, he died for. By the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. And it makes a difference how sorry and how deep in sin you are. He loves you and he'll forgive you. The adversary of the devil goes about seeking whom he may devour. A lot of people have the idea Satan's going to devour you by beating you up. He doesn't devour you by beating you up. He devours you by, by blinding your mind to the truth, by deceiving you, <clears throat> by hiding the face of God from you, by not allowing you to see the, the risen Lord Jesus in his glorified state. He came into this world to save sinners. This is a saying that is worthy of all acceptation. He didn't come into this world to build a religious system. He didn't come into this world to become a philosopher and bragged on by people. He didn't come into this world to be some great man. He came into this world to give himself so that you could be saved. And when you are, when you're born again, when you are really born of the Spirit of God, your life's going to change. Paul said, I'm a pattern for them that should hereafter believe. Did his life change? Oh, it changed. It changed profoundly. They said of him, the faith that he once tried to destroy, he now preaches. And the Bible said they glorified God in him because they couldn't explain it. It's the things that don't fit human reasoning and rationale. Everything that man reasons and everything that man understands, he does it to his own ego. He builds himself up in it because he's, he's solved the mystery. He's, he's fixed the problem. He's the master of his own fate. But when God intervenes, he completely changes it all. He turns it upside down. And he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. As the snow cometh down and the rain from heaven and watereth the earth that it may bring forth in bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. And Paul heard his word. I heard his word. I heard it with my ear for years. Then I heard it with my heart. And when I heard it with my heart, it changed my life. You see, the pattern that the apostle established for the rest of us is the pattern that I follow and you can follow and everyone else can follow. There are people tonight that will die for their religion. They will die for it. They are dedicated to it. And the world says, well, if, that, if he is as so sincere about what he believes, then what makes you different from him? That's the way the world sees it. That's the rational man. That's the natural man that receives not the things of the Spirit of God. But if you've ever been to Calvary and met the Lord Jesus Christ personally, it's not a matter of who is the most zealous. Folks, I honestly, be honest with you tonight, a lot of Baptists aren't real zealous. And some of these folks and cults are far more zealous than a lot of the Baptists are. But it doesn't make them right. What makes you right, preacher? The truth. Amen. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The only real safeguard you have against error and deceit and against the lies of this world is the truth of the Word of God. And the occult world, Satanism, hedonism, humanism, and all the rest of the isms are against the truth. That's your truth, they say. You believe the Bible, that's good for you, but I have my truth or I have my culture, 
I have my faith. We should respect everybody's faith because everybody is going to the same place. Not so. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Amen. Well, where would Paul's faith have led him, preacher, straight to hell? Amen. Why? He was a murderer. He was a murderer. And he was, he was of a system that had evolved from Babylon. The Pharisees started in Babylon. They started when Israel was in their 70 years of captivity. They were out of the land. Pharisaism was a reactionary movement against the Babylonians, but is also a reactionary movement to maintain uh, his identity of Israel, but it went overboard. Did all Pharisees go to hell? No. But the Apostle Paul took it to its, its extremes, and he became a murderer. We have no indication in the Bible that Nicodemus ever murdered anybody. He came to Jesus by night and says, We know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the things that thou doest except God be with him. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't rebuke him for being a liar. He didn't rebuke him for being a murderer. He rebuked him for not knowing more. He said, Thou art a teacher in Israel, a master in Israel, and knowest not these things. He should have known them, but he didn't know them. That's the sad thing. So the pattern that we should follow tonight is to get out the truth. Get it into the hearts of people. Get it into their heart. Sow it in their soul. Don't you get tired of empty, shallow professions of faith that don't last? Don't you get tired of that? Don't you get tired of people walking the aisle, shedding a few tears, and in six months they're right back where they came from? Is our faith no better than that? Is there nothing, is, is, is what we believe in the one who can save us tonight, is there not more power in the gospel than that? And the preacher spends all of his time then trying to get these backslidden people back in fellowship with God. Sorry, preacher, you're dead wrong. It's really not the work of the preacher to get the backslider back in fellowship with God. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Those I love, I chasten. That's right. If you know him and he knows you, he'll get you back. My, part, my, my responsibility is to get the Word of God out. And the longer I live, the more I'm convinced that the truth of this book is absolutely necessary for the conversion of the sinner. I'm talking about truth in the soul. I'm talking about when it's written in the heart. And a conversion, it's not a shallow thing. There is no such thing as a half conversion or, you know, a... Uh, what you, might, what you might say, well, he went part of the way, but didn't go all the way. You either are or you aren't. You're either born again or you're not born again. And God doesn't save good people and bad people. He saves people. I've heard people say, well, preacher, my daddy or my mama got saved and they were a good person and God just made them better. No, sir, you dead wrong. You missed it completely. There's a monster living right in here. And that monster still lives. And I will never make peace with that monster. And I will pray for God to give me discernment to know that monster when he raises his stinking, filthy, religious head. And when he begins to dominate my life, I want God to show me and I want to be able to confess it to the Lord and get on my knees and say, God, cleanse me of me, this monster that is unsaved. In all the years that I've been born again, since 1973, this monster hasn't changed a bit. It's still a monster. So what are you talking about, preacher? Look at Romans chapter number 7. When I would do good, what is with me always? What is present? What's it say? Evil. He didn't say the evil one. He said evil. Now, who wrote that? Paul. Well, the preacher was talking about the time before he was saved. No, sir. No, sir. No, but you're spinning your way out of it trying to say that. No, that's a saved man talking. I never considered myself a monster before I got saved. I was pretty cool. <laughs> I thought I was something. Oh, yeah. But then when I was born again, 
At first I had a great conflict because a newborn babe in Christ doesn't really understand the conflict. He doesn't understand it. But the longer you've been born again, the more you realize how that that mind that I'm thinking with tonight can either be renewed in the Spirit of Christ or it can be the old flesh. And there is nowhere in that Bible that it ever says to clean up that flesh. It says you can sanctify it in the sense that you can bring it into subjection, but it will never improve it. It will never change it. From the moment you're born again till the moment you leave this body, this flesh remains the enemy of God. It's a monster. And so I pray tonight that God gives me discernment. Me, I'm not, I can't handle your monster. <laughs> You're going to have to take care of your own monster. <laughs> it's all I can do to handle my monster. Next time you see some super spiritual saint, tell them that there's a monster living in them, and oh boy, you'll feel that pride. You'll see that pride well up. And they'll say, what are you talking about? There's no monster in me. As if to say, I have him quietened, and he's under control, and there's no problem. The problem is your spiritual pride has been wounded, and your spiritual pride is your problem. Amen. That's usually the biggest problem of Christians is spiritual pride. And Bible says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So I want God to teach me how to deal with my monster. You say, what kind of a monster is it? He's a mean one. He's wicked. He's vile. He's corrupt. He's the old man. He's a murderer. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering. Against such there is no law, all right? Fruit of the Spirit. He names all these things, all right? All right. The works of the fleshes is... Did I quote that wrong? Yeah. I did, didn't I? The works of the flesh, singular. All right? And then it names all of them. And that, in the listing of it, murderer, sodomite, all that stuff. Spiritual sins, fleshly sins. The flesh, therefore, has dwelling within its very nature the seed to be any of that. Now that's going to wound your spiritual pride for you to think, oh, there's no way that I could ever murder. The born again man will not. And if you bring your body into subjection, renew your mind and keep that monster under control, you won't. But you give him half a step and give place to the devil. And allow him to move into your life. You can wind up in a hell hole you never thought you'd ever be in your life. And you could wind up doing things you never thought you'd ever do. Amen. And then one day, send an email to the preacher, write me a letter and say, Preacher, I came to Temple Baptist Church and heard you preach. And I lived for the Lord for a while. Now I'm in prison. I never thought I'd ever be here. And I'm in here. And my life is wasting away. What happened to me? And the answer is very simple. We war a warfare. It's a war. It's not a game. It's not a football game. It's not basketball. It's not all the rest of that stuff. It's war. War. We war. And uh, you have to declare war. And you have to say, well, I'm going to fight this war until I'm gone from here. Amen. Till I draw my last breath, this enemy, this monster is an enemy, and I'm going to fight it until I'm gone. And the way you fight it is your weapons of your warfare are not carnal, are they? The weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. And Satan builds up strongholds in your life once you give him a place. And you give Satan a place, then he builds a stronghold. Once he builds a stronghold, that's a fortress. He can defend it. You see, 
you got a fortress and a stronghold, you don't have to attack the enemy. He's got to attack you. That's right. <laughs> and Satan has a stronghold in your life, you've got a weakness in there, and you know there's something that you better leave alone. You know there are places you better not go to. You know there are people you better not get around. You know there are things you better not read. You know there are things you better not watch. You know there are things you better not hear, because you got a, there's a stronghold in your life, and the only way that that stronghold can be affected is to be pulling down. It's to be pulled down. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God, to the pulling down of strongholds. How's that done, preacher? By the power of the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God and perseverance. And remind Satan who you are. It's good to tell him every day, I don't belong to you, Satan. I belong to Jesus. I've been washed in the blood. I've been born again. My sins are forgiven. Don't drag them back up to me. They're as cast as far as the east is from the west. He's forgotten them. You can accuse me all you want to, Satan. You can try to make me think I am, have not changed and I'm what I used to be. But you're a liar and a deceiver. In the name of Jesus, I know I have been born again. Amen. And I know that I'm going to be more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And I know that heaven is my home, and Satan, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone. Do it every day. And you'll be surprised at how that gets you in the battle and gets you equipped to go to battle. You do not send troops into battle without a weapon. You don't do that. You don't do that. And before you ever send them into, into, into combat with a weapon, you teach them how to use it. They go to the rifle range. Then when I was in there, we went to the rifle range. We spent two or three weeks on the rifle range. That's all we did every single day, every day on that rifle range, shooting that rifle, day after day after day after day. And then we went back to regular training. But for two weeks, our life was completely dedicated to that weapon. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And so that's the way it ought to be. You're dedicated. This is the weapon. This right here is the basis of all of our weaponry, the Word of God. What did the Lord use against Satan when he came against him? The Word of God. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. Thank you for letting us meet. I didn't know for a while we was going to be able to meet, Lord. You've heard what the weatherman said and what he said is coming and all that. So we didn't know what to do. We looked out and saw the snow. But you've made it possible. You allowed it to happen. You allowed people to watch it over the Internet. You allowed us to be here. I thank you for that. I pray for our folk now as they leave out of here tonight, you keep them safe as they journey to their homes, that they don't get in a mess out here somewhere and they're able to get home. I pray you'd bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.